Welcome to Talking Books, a series of in-depth discussions on the leading books of the day presented by the same people who bring you Talking Feds podcasts each week. Listeners to this podcast know that I've repeatedly tried to steer away from any sort of psychological analysis of Donald Trump on the theory that uh, that path lies madness, as well as a suspicion that there may be less there, maybe a lot less, than meets the eye. But if ever we can reach a fuller understanding of the 45th president, it's through the reporter who has covered him some 35 years from his roots in the New York real estate world, and who's widely thought to know him better than any uh, other reporter, namely Maggie Haberman. And the book she has just published, Confidence Man, uh, which shot to the number one spot on the New York Times bestseller list almost immediately after it was published, represents her fullest effort to come to grips with the president who has vexed the country most and that we arguably understand least. So Maggie Haberman is a White House correspondent for the New York Times. She was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize in 2018 for reporting on the investigations into Donald Trump's connections to Russia. Before joining the Times, she was a reporter for Politico, the New York Post, and the New York Daily News. Thank you so much for joining Talking Feds, Maggie Haberman. Thank you for having me. All right. So um, let's start here. Your peers recognize your longstanding professional relationship with Trump, dating from your shared New York City background. There's a great anecdote in the book from just after he won. Your colleague, Adam Nagorny, says, you wrote, this is great for you. And your response, wait till you see what's coming. So what did you have in mind and why did you think the press wasn't prepared for it? So a couple of reasons. Um, you know, it was it was pretty clear if you were paying attention to that campaign, you know, that Donald Trump was not temperable. He was not, um, you know, at least not for any durable length of time. Um, he had run this very slashing, dysfunctional, retribution minded campaign. He had an incredible desire to control everything around him and to dominate his own narrative and dominate his supporters and dominate his campaign aides and dominate the press. And, um, you know, and he was, he's very secretive, you know, he's a, he's a big believer in secrecy and, um, you know, I don't, I, th th we've had other secretive presidents, you know, but, but Nixon would be the main one who comes to mind. Um, and that obviously ended how it ended. Um, and because he's, you know, he was not, uh, knowledgeable about global affairs or about how the federal government works or, you know, much of anything in Washington. Um, but his anger dominated so much of that campaign, uh, that, you know, I think that people who weren't paying attention to the day-to-day -day rhythms of the campaign may have missed that he brought, you know, uh, women who had accused Bill Clinton of sexual impropriety, um, you know, or, or and, and in one case, a rape, um, to his debate with Hillary Clinton. I mean, this is just unheard of. And so um, I, I think that it was pretty clear where this was likely going to go and that the constraints of the presidency and official Washington were only going to go so far. And I just think the people who were not paying attention to the campaign didn't understand that. And we'll dig deeper into many of those um, aspects. L let's stick with um, your shared, well, your kind of shared roots, right? You're an Upper West Side kid, and he's more a kind of, a, you know, Queen's business world. But even so, from the same, uh, you know, Same city, the same, same city, yeah. yes, yeah. same city. So. So I, an animating idea of the book, I think, is that Trump, uh, in his New York days, developed a sort of playbook, and not such a big playbook even, while making his way in the New York real estate world, and that he just applied it without change to the presidency. So um, is it, A, is that fair? And B, you know, how would you describe the kind of main rules of the road of that world, the New York commercial real estate world? I would describe it that way. And I think it's not just uh, the commercial real estate world, you know, it, of which he represented a part, but not the whole thing, right? I mean, there were real estate developers who did not function the way he did. He was very, because he built, his father built in the outer boroughs, um, Trump was very engaged in, in, you know, machine politics of New York. New York had 
what can best be described as this kind of Tammany Hall derivative system of political entanglements for decades. And it really continued until a prosecutor named Rudy Giuliani um, started indicting people in the mid-1980s, uh, allies of, of then-Mayor Ed Koch. Uh, but aspects of the construction industry were corrupt. Aspects of the concrete industry were very mobbed up. Um, you know, Trump had no problem dealing with people who had, you know, who he was warned had questionable backgrounds. Um, aspects of the media were deeply transactional. His relationship with the New York Post is really what comes to mind, but not only the New York Post, honest, honestly, to be fair. And aspects of uh, the political system, as I mentioned, it wasn't just boss politics, but everything was, you know, what Marie Brenner, the journalist, described as the favor economy of New York. And so all of this, plus, and I'm, I'm forgetting an important piece here, in the 1980s in particular, at late 70s, early 80s, incredibly high crime. You know, the murder rate was hovering near 2000 in the early 1980s. Son of Sam um, days, right. And son yeah. of Sam days and, and a period of intense racial strife uh, in, the, in, the, in the two decades after the civil rights era. And so this is all the cauldron that forms how he looks at the world. And he's almost stuck there. And he exported that to Washington and, and to the Republican Party. Let me pick up on just that last aspect of it, the racial strife. I actually was living in the city not long after that, and I can certainly second it. Um, you know, as president, um, he seems to have had this instinct for kind of exploiting prejudice. Uh, I think, as you put it, you know, a skill in walking right up to the line of offensiveness, but leaving room for, for denial. But what's your sense both of the world and of him? Is it one of sort of rank prejudice? And you include in this also um, gays and lesbians uh, and just, you know, sort of invidious, um, uh, you know, nasty discrimination. Or is it more uh, because you also have anecdotes w involving both groups where he's at least sort of human um, is it more a kind of, you know, hierarchy, but not not the sort of nasty um, racial attitudes that we um, associate with, say, you know, other parts of society in other times? I mean, I guess you're asking me, like, is he a KKK member, right? And like, and I well, you know. first is the New York real estate world. Yeah, I, it's flat out KKK would be too, but the equivalent. And yeah, and then him as well. Did it? Was he just exploiting and going along? Or, well, I was you know, just—I was just trying to understand what the, I was trying to understand what the spectrum was here. What that's all yeah. what I was asking. Yeah. Look, I—I yeah. I don't think it's so much about the New York real estate world, although it certainly was aspects of it. Again, it was you know, Fred Trump and Donald Trump were were sued, um, you know, in in the nineteen seventies in nineteen seventy three by the federal government right. um, for for racially discriminatory housing practices. Now, another you know, real estate company run by a friend of the Trumps named Sam LaFrac, um, had also faced legal entanglements because of racially discriminatory rental practices, but he settled with the government and sort of tried to make changes. And Trump instead complained that he was being treated unfairly. Donald Trump's father, um, you know, was shown to have been arrested, um, during a, a KKK march, um, you know, through Queens. Now that KKK march was about, um, you know, Protestants and Catholics, but it, it, it was still the KKK. Um, and so I think that, you know, that speaks to, to sort of the, the milieu that Trump was coming from. Um, you know, Trump himself has a history of, as I write, you know, racist statements that he then insists he's being taken out of context. Um, he has extremely few black associates. Um, you know, there, there's an, an anecdote in the book where, uh, you know, a, a man who Trump is hiring from New York uh, city government wants to bring his black assistant with him and Trump's assistant, Norma Federer, who's long passed away, uh, you know, sort of reacts with surprise and says that they've never had a black uh, worker on the executive floors before. This is, this is 1980s. This is not 1950. Right. And so, um, you know, I think that, I think all that said, you know, Trump, when, when someone is useful to Trump, he engages with them. So Herschel Walker, when Trump owned, you know, the New Jersey Generals a football team when he was trying to crash the NFL and he was part of the USFL at that point, very useful to Trump. Um, you know, Trump. Well, uh, you have, you, I mean, even more so you have Don King and Al exactly, Sharpton. Exactly. And Al Sharpton, I was about to say, he, he, yeah, he engages over a very long period of time. 
um, yeah. with a number of, of, of high profile black figures. Um, you know, he, he tends to sort of put a, if he sees utility in someone, that's how he engages. Um, you know, but it doesn't exempt him from saying, it doesn't stop him from making these comments to your point about his comments on, on gay people. You know, he, uh, there was a, a, an executive who worked for him who was openly gay and to whom Trump was directly very accepting, you know, and, and was nice to the man's partner, um, and, and sought, you know, information about orthodontia from the man's partner for his own children, from Trump's children. But behind his back, he, you know, he described him according to, uh, you know, another form, another consultant who worked there, um, in disparaging terms, um, and using slurs about gay people. So this is how he operates. Okay, fair enough. I mean, but I, that seems consistent with me with both a total sort of Machiavellian world he's coming from, and as well as, you know, sort of just a deeply uh, bred invidious racism. Maybe it's hard to distinguish. I think for all of the belief that New York is an avatar of progressivism, there, there are a lot of pockets of regressive behavior, particularly when it comes to race. And I think that gets missed a lot. And that's part of why Trump, it's not just really near real estate. It's just New York. Um, that's yeah. why, that's why Trump did not, there were, there were ways in which he was more pronounced than others, but you know, he, he was not so out of step with a lot of white people in New York city, including white liberals that, um, that he stood out that dramatically. Maybe especially in, in the, in the boroughs, but that's a whole different subject. No, I think, um, I think there's that, parts of Manhattan too. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And so just another aspect, again, of sticking with New York. So as a president, he's been spectacular. Here's, here's a way in which your um, statement to Nagorny really comes home. I, I think the country wasn't ready for such a spectacularly flagrant liar who, you know, he seems almost instinctually to reach for the, the huge fib. Um, and there are some instances in the book where he's, you know, being dishonest. But was that also when you covered him in you know, in the days in New York? Was he also just a, you know, sensationally promiscuous liar? I mean, he, you know, the the, the thing in common that everyone says when I ask them, uh, when I would talk to them about covering Trump, you know, decades ago, one person said, you know, I said, what stood out to you about covering him? And this person without missing a beat said, I never knew somebody who, who, could, who lied like that. And so, <laughs> you know, he, people knew that he said things that were not true quite frequently. Um, you know, I think when it was seen as covering somebody where the stakes were relatively low when he was an entertainer or he was in real estate. Um, and I think that it's a reminder of sort of the, um, there are longer and sometimes unforeseen consequences to uh, to news coverage. And, and the fact that he kind of built this artifice about himself brick by brick as he was myth-making about his own um, business prowess uh, was one of them. I'm now remembering, I think this is accurate, that his bizarre and brazen habit of being his own uh, uh, PR guy under a different name start was was he initiated in New York being you know actually uh, masquerading as a PR guy somebody Miller um, okay so final question about uh, New York as you just mentioned so um, we're less from your book but a little bit but that's just generally we have the the sense that. He wanted to be a big macher in New York and top of the line with the Manhattan crowd, but that he was considered, you know, more of a piker, not not really deeply respected as in the upper echelon within his um, profession. Is that accurate? And do you think that rankled him? It's definitely accurate. It definitely rankled him. He wanted to be seen as commensurate with figures like Harry Helmsley. Uh, and he just wasn't because he didn't build like that. Um, you know, but what I try to get into is that outside of New York, you know, that was, that was harder for people to see and realize because, you know, to most of the, he's much richer than most of the country, even if he's not worth what he claims he is. Um, you know, he's still a very wealthy man. And so, you know, to people outside the bubble of New York, they just hear people arguing over who's richer. 
um, you know, the, the, and, and, the, and the, the realities of what he was or wasn't building tend to get lost. All right. So one uh, more question from his past, and then we'll, we'll move to 2015. Um, his father. So, I, I mean, his whole family, um, you know, figures in. I was sort of intrigued with the way the brother gets pushed aside. But his dad, in your words, brutalized him and did seem to smother his sort of young ambitions on the one hand. On the other, you know, he cries uh, when, he, when he dies. He's got one picture for a long time in the Oval Office that's of his dad. What's your sense of the role that his father played in, in shaping him even to the you know, present day? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, his father really was... Um... Uh, his father really was, was his rosebud moment, um, you know, over and over and over again. Uh, his father was, um, uh, you know, somebody who he resented and admired and, and respected and feared. Um, but his father just sort of governed everything that young Donald Trump did and informed so much of how he behaved, including, I was thinking about, you were talking about the, the pretending to be a PR person. Uh, yeah. Fred Trump used to pick up the phone sometimes and use an alias and he would tell people it was because, uh, you know, contractors would, would jack up the rates when he was working with them if they knew that it was for Fred Trump. But if it was for Harry Green, it was, you know, not a problem. And, and I just think Fred Trump dictated so much of what Donald Trump became, except Fred Trump was a, was a very good businessman. And, you know, he cut corners and he played all kinds of, you know, mirage games with taxes and so forth. And my colleagues have documented that really extensively in the pages of the times, but he was, um, you know, he was a very good businessman in a way that Trump just does not. Trump is a very good self promoter, but Trump is just not known as an effective businessman. And, and you think he sort of feel in some deep Oedipal way or whatever that, 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 um, lives within him, the, the sense that he doesn't live up to his dad. I, th I think his father is in his head all the time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so flashing forward now to the beginning of his presidency, when interestingly, notwithstanding, maybe we'll get to this more, your very sort of love-hate relationship with him, they wanted you to document the famous um, walk down the escalator. But, you know, I, it strikes me that the real challenges for a presidential biographer to, are to try to explain, you know, what makes the president tick and what enabled them to attain the presidency. And those those seem so uh, challenging to me for Trump in particular. Maybe it's just because we're so close to him. But starting with the sort of what makes him tick. So one, um, one shocking detail from your book, uh, Maggie, uh, is this documentation from his childhood as a little boy throwing rocks of a, of a seeming joy, you know, sadistic joy in crushing enemies uh, and in, you know, the, the a vengeance streak that is undying, you know, uh, John McCain having crossed him a little in the 1990s, giving rise to the, like, shockingly uncouth uh, slight in the wake of, his, of McCain's death, etc. So, you know, this sense of vengeance how deep a motivator do you think it is for him? And, and where does it come from, if you, you know, have a sense? Um, uh, I think that, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of that is Roy Cohn. I think it's actually less his father, although his father certainly, you know, liked striking back at the elites and liked striking back at the government for um, how they treated him. And, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, I just think it's, um, I think it's mostly Roy Cohn, but I think a lot, I mean, uh, to, to give agency to, to Donald Trump, I think some of this is just him. I think that he, you know, for whatever reason, um, he cannot brook any slight, you know? I mean, he can if he decides it's in his interest, um, but, you know, wounds that he's caused, you know, need to be paid back. I mean, you call him both the most thin-skinned and thick-skinned person you've covered or ever known or do, do you do you have yourself having been you know on the on the uh, receiving end of uh of 
dyspepsia from him, a sense of what it, you know, what what trips the wire and what he is able to just um, blithely ignore. Yeah, I mean, he, look, he really is able to slough off coverage that would flatten other people. Um, you know, he he doesn't care about it. He doesn't take it as a uh, as significant. Um, but he uh, he is um, uh, on issues that he feels like he's being his intelligence is being slighted. You know, so for instance, when you comment on how much television he watches, he takes that as you know a mark on his intellect. Um, he doesn't like when people. No, it's, it's completely accurate, right? He, he watches That's a lot funny. of television. He, you know, if you, <laughs> if you if you comment on his his wealth as being less than he says it is, that's a real area of concern. Yeah. Um, you know, anything about his strength or virility, he, you know, he he recoils from. And so those are the kind things that go to his his self image are uh, are really it. So switching to the other side, which doesn't seem to bother him and and so many people, including me, find kind of stunning. Uh, and that is, I think you documented in many, many different ways, this, you know, complete indifference and lack of curiosity about any factor that you normally think a president is engaged in public policy, what works and what doesn't, even if for political reason. Did you ever see him display interest in any aspect of the common wheel or government? Look, I mean, there are, there are certainly aspects of, of how, uh, you know, specific functions work. Military, uh, you know, would be the main one uh, that he was interested in, certain aspects of national security. Um, but learning the, the depths and mechanisms of, of Washington and the way that the federal government fun- functioned, no, that was just never something that he was particularly interested in. I mean, do you think he cared a lot? He, ob- he used to early in his presidency boast about being, you know, second only to Lincoln. And that was provisional. I mean, do you think he cared about being good at the job as opposed to appearing? No, to he, he cared. Person? He cared about being seen as good at the job. There was this one kind of interesting thing you write. I, others have picked up on as well. That did seem almost like an idea, you know, Machiavellian, but an idea, which is this notion of hate as a civic good which uh, I I think came from his lips. Can you elaborate on what that means and, you know, what, how it kind of is manifested in in his presidency? Sure. It came from my, it was my, my term. And it was in response to, I I wrote about it as I was describing his um, uh, full page ad that he took out in 1989 after the the infamous Central Park Jogger case. And Ed Koch, then the mayor had urged citizens not to have, hate and rancor, those were his words, in their hearts for um, the extremely young men, uh, all of whom were of color, who had been charged with this crime. It's very important to note that their their confessions were later deemed coerced and the convictions were vacated, uh, but they had already served a ton of prison time at that point. Um, And Trump, you know, in his ad said, you know, I want society to hate them. You know, that basically people, sh- you should hate people who do bad things. And what I said was that it was essentially, you know, as close to a, uh, uh, you know, a, a guiding ethos as, as Trump had, which was that hate should be a civic good. And I think we did see that throughout his presidency. Look at how, look at how he used his Twitter feed. Look at, you know, look at his, his ban on, on travel from Muslim majority countries. Look at, you know, look at look at the look look at the child separation policy. I mean, I think this is, you know, he 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 extols the virtues of of hate over and over again. So let's double back now to the to the people that he cares about, uh, at least cares about their views. Um, he does, as you seem in general, as you to care about how he's held or seen by like political elites. But he seems to hold most of them in contempt, at least back and forth. Is, is that your your sense? I don't you you I don't um, see any sense of like respect or admiration on his part for any of the political leaders of the Republican 
party or anyone who notwithstanding that he cares what they think about him. Is that, is that, I mean, he, well? he, he tends to view people in terms of how they treat him or view him. I don't, I don't think that that's a mystery at this point. Um, you know, and I, you know, the Republican party is always a party that he was likelier to gravitate toward because mm -hmm. of the, particularly the focus on law and order. I think he was just always going to be, I've been asked a few times this week, you know, what if he had been a Democrat? And he was a Democrat right. at one point. He was, but, for a you know, yeah, but he was, he was a pro-choice yeah. Democrat. But he was, but he was always going to be a Republican nationally. He just always was, and so yeah. it was a much more natural home for him. Um, um, you know, he likes people if they're nice to him. I mean, literally everything is an up or down referendum on himself. It's not yeah. broader than that. I think, I think, I think in this conversation, I think that I think, and I understand why, but I think you're looking for. A nor a, as everyone does, sort of a, a conventional yeah. frame to apply to him, and right. it just doesn't just doesn't it work. Just which there. is what I which is what I try to explain in the book. Right. Um, okay. Um, I so I hear you there. How about his base, which you know, cont which is I think the explanation for the fear he's able to wield over people in the party who seem to have, to have content for him, even as they're, uh, um, you know, genuflecting. Do you have a sense that he, um, you know, loves his people or, um, you know, they're the ones he, he goes to. Um, but, um, well, let me just leave it there. Yeah. What, I mean, what, I, what look, you, I, I think that his views about his base? I think that his base are, they are, they are customers, right? I mean, I think that if you, if you look at that, he has basically co-opted the Republican party as like essentially a Trumpian product line. His base yeah. or his base is his customers and, you know, he and consumers and sometimes he loves them and sometimes, sometimes he resents them and sometimes he, you know, for instance, he's been complaining to people that he can't get credit for, um, the vaccines because of the quote unquote radical right. Um, you know, that's resentment. He really is proud of, of the vaccines, uh, the, the, anti, the, the, the COVID fighting vaccines that, you know, the pharmaceutical industry was going to move ahead regardless, but the fact that the weight of the presidential administration was behind them was not nothing. And so, um, you know, but he won't talk about that now because it gets booed. So that's a, yeah. he has a complicated relationship. I know you're not eager to, um, to delve too deeply into his psyche, but here's a kind of a basic one that I just wonder what your view is. You know, he wants to be acknowledged, liked, feared, whatever it is. Um, you know, the president of the United States is the ultimate job in the world in some sense. And yet as president, he seemed often full of rage and bitterness. Um, do you think he liked being president? Did he enjoy it sort of day to day? No, that's a good question. I mean, I asked a friend of his at the end of 2017, does he like, I asked him that question and the friend said, oh yes. And I said, well, what does he like about it? And the friend said, you yeah. know, Air Force One, Marine One, you know, so he liked the trappings of being president. Um, I don't think that the day to day job and work of the presidency, you know, appealed to him uh, in any meaningful way. Now, the, the, to be fair, the presidency is, you know, often different than what everyone who's coming into it thinks it's going to be. It's, there's a reason we've only had, you know, uh, the, the 46 that we've had. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, an incredibly difficult job that most people never get to. And most people probably, you know, realistically couldn't do. I, but, but he was, he's just not interested in governance the, the, the way that, um, you know, any other president that we've seen in, in modern history has been. Um, and he's not interested in the processes of a democracy that, you know, that, that, that got the U.S. to where it is now. So, uh, I, yes, I think he enjoyed aspects of it. I think he enjoyed the, you know, the, the conceptual power. Um, I just don't think he enjoyed the day to day. Yeah. Um, that, putting it that way in the trappings, I think, is a very interesting vantage point on the current uh, scandal and the, you know, his wanting to have uh, taken away certain, you know, mementos at a minimum, maybe also very valuable national state secrets. Um, I wonder if you have a sense of that. Now, I know you talked to him about it and he flat out lied to you. He said, oh, I didn't take anything. Uh, nothing, no, no, nothing of great urgency. Yeah. Was, yeah. But, um, and um, 
Is it is it your do you, do you have a view? Is is at least the the major part of it just like keeping some of the toys even after he has to leave the the White House, the love letters and the and you know what presidents get to possess. You know, Chris Christie on on and Chris Christie, who knows Trump as well as anyone, yeah. had a line on on ABC a couple of weeks ago that I thought was very smart, which was that you know Trump was trying to um, you know it was part of. Trump's mental pretending he's still president, you know, something that I described in a story as walking around on the phantom limbs of his expired presidency. And that might be true. Yeah. That might be right. Um, it also might be that he likes trophies, which he does, because anyone who's ever been to his Trump Tower office has seen him. You know, he does a tour with everyone of here's this, you know, here's Shishkill on your shoe and here's this. Um, yeah. And then, um, you know, it also might be that he wanted leverage of some kind because much of what he does is about leverage. And uh, I don't, that could mean a number of different things depending on the scenario. Yeah. Uh, you may, I think you had uh, three interviews with him post-presidency. Is that right? Yeah, but that's right. You describe right. Mar-a-Lago as being a kind of a, you know, this interesting shrine and they still call him president Trump and uh, you know, the notion now it's coming up with being asked to testify that he's a former president seems a little iffy in his own mind. Um, all right, let me let's let me ask you a little bit about I'll just ask you this about January 6th. You know, you do write that he has a willingness to say just anything is true and believe anything is true. Yes. So do you I mean, you document very interestingly in the book, Maggie, at first, you know, he says certain things that make the laws clear. He, he gauges their their efforts you know, at, at about a 40% shot to, to ob obviously overcoming what had happened. Based on, based on nothing, okay. based on nothing. Yeah, of course, apparently. Yeah. It sort of throws but, it out But, there, but the but question yeah. is, do you have a view as to whether he believed he had won? He would pass a lie detector test about did he, did he win? Based on everything that I have heard, uh, you know, he, he seemed to realize he had not won. Um, you know, after the first couple of days. And I think that the House Select Committee has found similar evidence. And then I think that when yeah. it, when the reality of Joe Biden being, you know, declared the president-elect became clear, I think he changed his tune. So that's what I think. So, but grafting all that evidence onto the person that you know, and, you know, maybe it's tough, maybe this is the quality of a salesman to just always, you know, you've got to be sincere whether you believe yeah. it or not. But when you say he changed his tune, you mean he got emphatic to try to to try to hunker down, mm -hmm. but but not that he changed his. Well, you, well you I don't know, know what's in I don't know what's in his head. I mean, I can't. I really yeah. can't. I've been asked this question a bunch in the last week. In right. particular, does he believe yeah. that he does he really believe what he's saying? I think at this point he probably does, um, because yeah. you know he he sometimes does convince himself of these things. You know, he also has said to a number of people over many years a version of. If you say this something often enough, it becomes true. And so yeah. I, you know, it's impossible for me to, to, you know, divorce that from what he's saying. I just think that he's, um, I, I don't know that it matters if he believes it or not. Right. I, I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's unless, unless, you know, I, I think as a prosecutor, you probably find that to be a more compelling question than, than as a journalist, yeah. I do, because as yeah. a journalist, my question is, how is that, you know, how is this impacting events in front of me? Not what's the mindset of somebody who may or may not be getting charged, which right. the January 6th investigation obviously is looking at. Yeah. Um, I mean, they are trying to, to dive deep. I'll just say that to the extent that seems an important question, if it continues to be inscrutable to you who've known him for so long, you know, it suggests it's, you know, never, never going to be definitively answered. Um Let's move off him for a moment to, um, uh, you know, what happens after him, if there is an after him. I, I certainly have been among those who thought he had finally, um, you know, made his own grave and to be wrong and wrong and wrong again. But, um, you know, he, he is a singular personality for sure, as you draw him. Um, the um, what what's your sense? You talked about the, the his relativism. I think is the term you seeping into the national body. Um, what's your sense of Trumpism after Trump, which I guess would be his true legacy? Does it does it flourish because you know it's been um, people have gotten this sort of 
now playbook to use, or is it so dependent on his the particular, I guess you would say something like charisma uh, or personality of him? Does it, that question make it, sense? It, it, it's a great question, and I just don't I don't think we know the answer yet because I think so much more has to happen, including potentially another candidacy by Trump, including another potential presidency by Trump. We just we just don't know. Um, you know, I, I certainly think that he has unleashed forces that were nascent in the country for a long time. He didn't create them. He just, he just didn't, but he did accelerate them and, and capitalize on them. Um, and I, I, I think that things can be very hard to put back in the bottle. Um, you know, I think that we are the, the, the big question for the next couple of years, I think, or a big question is this sort of mainstreaming of threats of political violence that we are seeing increase. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know whether that abates or continues to slowly ramp up. Yeah. I, I, I had that in mind when you were talking about the customers he liked, you know, he doesn't like the far right if they made it harder for him. But one of the, you know, most stunning aspects of his presidency is in both Charlottesville and even more January 6th, his basic inability to condemn what you would think, you know, 98% of the country would be quick to, to condemn and to really call them, you know, we love you, you're patriots, go home. I mean, the, it was like even marauders were, in a sense, his people, and that was good enough for him. You know what I mean? I don't think that it's 98% of the country that would have condemned it. I think that's the, that's the issue, Larry. I think it's bigger than that. Yeah. And so... Uh, you mean smaller than that? I think sixty percent. Yeah, I think yeah. Sorry, I think it's it's. I think yeah. the number of people who would not condemn it is bigger than than two percent. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think that um, you know, but 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 you expect a president to, and um, yeah. and he just he just wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like instinctually it wasn't it wasn't with him. Um, you're you feel I think more than anything we've looked at the previous interviews. The question: Will he run? Won't he run? Etc. I I I won't. Um, ask you to be a soothsayer, but again, just focusing on him as a person. What do you think the fact, what, what would make him run and not make him run? What are the factors that you think will matter most in his decision? I mean, I think that he's backed himself into a corner where he has to. I think that in order to stay relevant. Has to order, run? Yeah, in order to stay relevant, in order to keep raising money. And, and also, I just think he sees it as a, shield against a lot of these investigations. So um, I think that's I think that's what we're going to see. OK, and that makes sense. Let me just be counterpose the point of, you know, we 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 tried to get at maybe shied away from some some fear that that motor. You know, I mean, do, do you think there's don't you think he's afraid of losing and as being the sort of, you know, coda on his career or. I think that he already lost, and that's the coda on his career. So I think that he will just no, say everything no. is rigged and stolen, and I think he'll use the same playbook that he did before. And I think that he genuinely believes that everything is corrupt. I mean, I think that that's, that really gets lost here. He genuinely believes everything is corrupt, and, you know, uh, that he's just more upfront about it than other people. And so I don't think that's a huge mental stretch for him. The book is Confidence Man. The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America, the author Maggie Haberman. Thank you so much for spending time discussing it today, Maggie. Good luck with it. Congratulations on all your success with it. Thanks for having me.